Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Burns. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, everybody. What I found is that what I learned in this program is that my greatest asset or my greatest treasure is my experience. I will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. Because with that experience, I may be able to carry a message to one of you in this room. And certainly it's a message I need to hear. With that experience, I may be able to help one of you. And I will try to tell you that. I do know that it's taken everything it's taken in my life for me to be where I am today. I also want you to know I respect deeply this program of Alcoholics Anonymous, the personalities and the principles. I would not consciously, at least consciously, ever do anything to offend anybody or to hurt anybody. But I will try to tell you my story. It will include parts of my story, which are just parts of my story. And I, there are places in this country I have not been asked to go speak because of parts of my story. And I'm not condemning them, nor am I condoning me. I'm just, made, I'm just stating that this is my experience, and it's what God has given me. As you've listened to these speakers this weekend, and I tell you, this, these are some powerful people. I'm really honored to be with these speakers because y'all are incredibly powerful. But I can remember when I was sitting out in the audience listening to some of the speakers at times, especially the speakers with the power of the speakers we've heard this weekend, it was both enlightening, spiritual, made me cry, and confused the hell out of me sometimes. And that's just simply because of where I was. Uh, and I know there was a time when I wanted, if I could listen to those speakers with that magnitude and do exactly what they told me to do, then maybe I could get it. Well, the fact is, I wasn't where they were. And there were times they weren't where I was. And I got crazy as hell a lot of times trying to do exactly what those speakers said they did. Because there's no way in a period of time of one hour, one hour and 15 or 20 minutes, we can fill in all the gaps on what we're saying that have been etched in our experience and etched in our souls. And we may leave out real important parts and you just get point A and point C and we forget to say point B and you walk away believing that point C is absolutely the truth, point A is absolutely the truth. How in the hell did they connect the two? <laughs> and that's just the way it is. But we will give you everything we've got. And what we've got is a lot because we haven't found it necessary to take a drink today. And what we have done is we followed the spiritual principles to be happy. Sunday morning speaker has a lot of advantages and disadvantages. One of the advantages is is that uh, that I get to listen to all the other speakers and and uh, and get to sit back and relax because it doesn't intimidate me to be up here. Maybe it should, but it doesn't. Uh, one of the disadvantages is that I don't get an opportunity to talk with you after I've talked so that I can share with you some of those gaps. So that I can share with you some of those gaps. Big Book tells me I have a peculiar mental twist. Clancy calls it disease of perception. Joe Way from Cincinnati calls it delusion. I really can relate to all that. The book, what, I, what I've come to relate to fairly recently is this peculiar mental twist. Now, for me, that peculiar mental twist is not just related to the idea of drinking. It's also related to the idea of thinking. And if I don't deal with the thinking, I go back to the drinking. The peculiar mental twist. I heard this expressed in a joke not too long ago down in uh, down in West Texas, Beaumont. And I this t this is the alcoholic peculiar mental twist. This is the way I think. And for those of you that I know, it's the way you think too. It tells this story about this traveling salesman in East Texas. Bad drink, as we say in Kentucky, he was bad to drink. He traveled all over West, West Texas, and he'd spend a week in one place and a week in the next place, and he'd just go in there and get soused every night. And they knew that he was going to get soused, so they set him up in a deal where that they did the things for him each night when he checked in. He did this circuit, he circuit road, circuit road, circuit road, one place a week, one place a week, checking the motel. Finally, he left Beaumont that week after he'd been there for the week, and he just had all this fun he could tolerate. So he went home got into AA. Comes back a month later, checks into the motel. He's now going to AA. They don't know he's going to AA. He goes out to an AA meeting that night. They think he's going to dinner and get drunk. He'll be back. So they set him up like they always set him up. He comes in, checks into the room, switches on the light. Sure enough, there it is. A quart of whiskey sitting on the bedside table and two beautiful women sitting on the end of the bed. 
He set him up like they always did. He said, well, he said, I tell you what. He said, I've joined AA and I've asked them what I got to do not to get drunk and to be happy. And they told me that I just have to quit drinking and change everything else I'm doing. He said, so I can't drink that whiskey. And one of you girls has got to go. <laughs> Isn't that AA thing? That's the way we think. See, that's the way we think. I, maybe it's not the way you think, but I'll bet by God it is, isn't it? You know? <laughs> Half measures availed him something, but we don't know whether that's short-term gain or long-term pain. That's just the deal. <laughs> but that's the peculiar mental twist. You know, I, I heard somebody say one time, I treat my mind like a bad neighborhood. I never go in there alone, you know? <laughs> I love that because it's absolutely the truth. What I found is that peculiar mental twist has a bedrock. It has a foundation, and that bedrock and that foundation is based on what you taught me is self-centered fear. All I've ever known is fear. All I've ever known is fear. From the, my earliest memory, it's been afraid. I don't even know the etiology or the cause of that. I've been through eight years of psychiatric therapy, and I know a lot, and I do know some definitions, and I do know some things, but all I know is that I felt fear as long as I've ever known a feeling. In this program, I'd wake up in the morning and there was a feeling that I didn't want to get up because the day would begin. I didn't want to quit drinking when I was drinking at night because that meant I'd have to go to sleep and I'd get up and the day would begin. And that day was going to whip my ass. <clears throat> I would turn a corner somewhere, sometime there'd be something there bigger and meaner and faster than me. And I couldn't handle it. And the self-centeredness on the top of that meant that I had to live in this delusion, this incredible delusion of trying to figure out how to be adequate. The big book says, what is the foundation of our fear? It's the fear of the failure of our own self-reliance. What does that mean? I've got to be able to handle it. Translating as a deep, deep feeling of inadequacy. I can't handle it. There are two delusions I found this, in this program of recovery. Two delusions I found in the human condition. The delusion of, at least in mine, the delusion of immunity and the delusion of adequacy. The delusion of immunity is I can play by a different set of rules. Inside or outside recovery. See, I've got... I've got, had four hospitalizations to a mental hospital in Louisville, and they've got a, they have got a diagnosis for me, and it's called psychopathological narcissistic sociopathic personality disorder. <laughs> and you see, it's damn close. It's damn close. <laughs> Because they made that diagnosis on the way I behaved, and that's exactly the way I behaved. There was a fundamental difference. Deep inside was a sense of absolute guilt and shame that ate my lunch. And that person they diagnosed me as doesn't know that. It's what Wilson called constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There's also another major difference between that diagnosis and my diagnosis of alcoholism. That diagnosis is not treatable. And mine is treatable. Mine's treatable. There's hope for me. And you're like me. There's hope for you. We act goofy as hell. But there's hope. There's hope. There is light. And there are rules. Silkworth was the first one that I read. said, these men, if they follow a few simple rules. People say, these are suggestions. I don't really know that I have to do it that way because I don't feel that that's in my best interest. I don't know what you had to do, but I had to follow the rules and still have to follow the rules. Even inside this program with the rules, I will bend them. God, on a daily basis, I just want to find one little way through that delusion, that peculiar mental twist, to bend that little rule, you know? you got to work 12 steps. I think I'll try it with 11 today, you know? I don't set out to do that because that's not the kind of person I am. But it is the kind of person that I am. And that's the thing I've got to deal with. There's a wonderful joke an old-timer in, in, in Louisville used to say about the frog and the scorpion. Frog and the scorpion on this island. Scorpion kept trying to steal the, the, to sting the frog. 
Frog kept getting away from him. Finally, one day, here came this big tidal wave in over the island. <laughs> came in over the island, and the frog started swimming away, and the scorpion said, take me with you. And the frog said, I'm not taking you with me. You'll try to sting me. He said, man, if I sting you, you'll die, and if you die, I'll die. He said, well, he said, that makes sense. He said, hop on, I'll take you. So tidal wave came in. They're out there swimming across the ocean. Scorpion raised up and pops him. Frog rolls over on his back and he's dying. He said, why did you do that? He said, I don't know. That's just the kind of son of a bitch I am. <laughs> and I, today I find humor in that because that's just the way. I, I sit around and say, who said that? And I look around, ain't nobody in the room but me, you know. <laughs> Ain't nobody in the room. The delusion of immunity, the delusion of adequacy. And what I found out in this program, in this wonderful program that we shared together, is I am inadequate. I am inadequate. Alone. 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 I've not found one problem in this recovery process that is so big that we can't handle it. You and I and God have been able to handle everything. <coughs> I've never had to be alone since I walked in this program. Even at times when I tried, you didn't let me. Even at times when I tried, you didn't let me. And I'm deeply grateful to you too. You didn't let me. I'm a doctor. I tell you that because for 25 years I practiced family medicine and a little over two years ago I left because it through the grace of God and some direction and a lot of sharing with significant people, it was felt that I would be of more service to God and my fellow man in another capacity than practicing medicine. You may say, how in the world can you do that? Well, I found some ways where that's true. Uh, and, and I missed medicine. I enjoyed it. it was, I, was, I was good because I worked to be good. During that period of time, uh, because I cared, because I really cared. I've never worked with an alcoholic who doesn't care. There's a sense of deep goodness in us that defies description, almost defies belief. But for 25 years, I practiced medicine. I guess I saw every disease there is to see, <clears throat> and at least in our country. I never saw one disease that even comes close to the devastation of the disease of alcoholism. AIDS comes close, but I tell you, it doesn't quite make it. Now you can say, I've never had AIDS, but I've worked with a significant number of AIDS patients and people with AIDS that are dying and people with AIDS with alcoholism. And I can tell you, at least my perception today, is that there's no disease that comes close to the disease of alcoholism. It takes everybody prisoner and salvages none. It takes everybody prisoner and salvages none. I found only one power in those 25 years and in my 16 years of recovery that can even come close and actually can deal with the disease of that devastation, and that's the power of love. That's the power of love. When I was a little boy in Mayfield, Kentucky, swinging in a little swing in kindergarten Sunday school, they'd say to me, God is love, God is love. God is love. And it just kept playing in my head. When I came to you people beaten down with nothing left, just a shell, but an absolute <coughs> hope and prayer that you'd be there for me and that I'd be able to figure out what it is you had, <clears throat> I'd say, God is love. We get to the third step. First two steps came easy. Third step didn't. wasn't because I didn't want it. I was not rejecting God. I wanted him desperately in my life, but I could not grasp that third step. And I got to tell you, I thought, my God, I'm not going to get it. It's not going to work for me. What I've come to know over the years, and this is some scientific stuff, but it may answer some questions for some of you, is that's an abstract concept. That's an abstract, and we cannot think in abstracts for probably two to five years. We got sawdust for brains. <laughs> and anybody who thinks you can speed that up, trust me, you can't. It just takes time. It takes time. It's sawdust for brains, and the majority of that basis is physical. And I would sit there, and I'd think... Oh, I turned my life, my will. Oh, my God, I, what, I can't get it. And I'd say, God is love. And there would become peace in my life. There would become peace in this process. God is love. This is my story. Doesn't have to be yours yet. May never be. But this is mine. And this is what I'm here for, to give you my story. God is love. If there's one principle synonymous with the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, for me, it's love. Bill Wilson said, and Clancy shared with us last night, that incredibly emotional experience of Wilson showing up 
1970 at the International. The talk that I was familiar with, that was Bill Wilson's last talk, was one he wrote in the fall of 1970 that Lois actually read. At least that's the history that I've read. And in that talk, he hammered on two principles. One was the principle of anonymity. He came to believe in that with deeper conviction. The other was the uh, was the principle of... Uh, mm, so emotional to me, it just blocked me out for just a minute. <clears throat> I don't do that very often, but this has been a very emotional weekend for me. The other was the principle of change. He said AA must and will change. That has perplexed a lot of people. It perplexed me, but as the years have rolled by, what I have seen is that the face of Alcoholics Anonymous has changed. The principles have not. The principle of love is as intact today as it has ever been. But the face has changed. I talked to Miss Geraldine D. from New Jersey. She's been sober now about 50 years. And I said, Miss D., I said, has AA changed since you came in? She didn't hesitate. She said, yes, boom, just like that. And I said, how has it changed? She said, when I came in, she said, there were at least 10 to 15 or 20 old timers. Now, those old timers, remember, this was in the early and middle 40s. So they're old timers. I don't have the kind of old timers we've got. She said there were at least 10 to 15 old timers for every newcomer. She said today there may be 20, 30, and 40 newcomers for every old timer. She said we must maintain the purity of the principles. I said, how do we do that? And she said, we continue to teach our textbook. I go to five meetings a week right now, and two of those meetings are always involved in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and teaching it. Now, we're not trying to read the white part between the lines. We're trying to keep it as simple as was talked to us about last night. We're not trying to read small print. We're trying to help people be able to read the big print with our own experience. We're not dissecting the depth of the meaning. <laughs> we're following the directions that are written. And let me tell you, that gets harder and harder as people are running out here in the bushes at times and coming back and wanting to dissect the meaning, to be able to read exactly what it says. But the face has changed. The principles have not. I was in Beaumont. Uh, our face of AA today, as we see it many times, and as, as I've come to know it, these two men in suits sitting beside the bed talking to this man with his T-shirt on. The magnificent principle of love, the message, the messenger and the message and the receiver and the reciprocity. These two men sitting beside this bed talking to another man. When I was in Beaumont approximately two years ago, I got up on Sunday or Saturday morning about 7 o'clock and I looked out by the pool and here was the new face of AA. Two little girls, 15 years old, sitting beside the pool with chairs facing each other and they're holding each other's hands. And on the table beside them is a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous open. Seven o'clock in the morning. And these two little angels holding each other's hands. And they would pray. And you'd see their lips move and their little eyes be closed. And they'd reach over and they'd turn a page. And they'd read. And they'd reach back and hold each other's hands. The new face of Alcoholics Anonymous. Message to messenger. Message with messenger, reciprocity with the principles of alcoholics, and people loving people, learning the rules. We're in good hands. You know what's changed the face of AA are the women and the children. In the brief time that I've been here, I've seen the children come. They're a pain in the ass sometimes, but they are our hope. <laughs> Where do they come to learn that discipline at the end of the 11th step says, as alcoholics, we are undisciplined. We allow God to discipline us in this way. Who are the ones who are going to discipline these children? By God, it's us. <laughs> and there are a ton of us running around who haven't learned the discipline. And I ain't preaching, folks, because it's my story. I lived here without that discipline. And today I don't live there anymore. I live here with the discipline. And I assume, accept, and am glad to take on the responsibility of teaching those children. Because if we hadn't let them in, I'd have two of them that would be dead today. And my wife would be dead today. And I greatly accept with gratitude the responsibility and the necessity to learn that discipline and to teach those children. Since I've been in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I've found very few things that have not changed. 
I found very few things that are constant on a daily basis. First thing that has not changed in my life is that my life is constantly changing. <laughs> I'm not the same person that walked in this program. I have the same sense of humor, which is weird at times. Uh, I basically have the same good heart and good nature, but I've been constantly changing. Now, what has changed in this constant process is people say, well, those are different plateaus of growth. I don't relate to that. I, re I relate to it intellectually. What I relate to inside my heart is they are different plateaus of surrender. As I've gone through this program at different levels in this program, I have found that I have had to surrender to God's power, God's power, God's power, God's power. Most of the time I surrender to God's power just about the time my nose gets broken for the third time and I got an in, almost inescapable case of diarrhea, you know? <laughs> and I'm sitting there saying, oh, I'll, grunt, I'll get that, you know, the alcoholic problem-solving technique is if I can't get a square peg in a round hole, I just get a bigger hammer. Wop, 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 you know? If one-fourth step won't do it, do seven. <laughs> Don't dare get to the sixth and seventh step. I remember I went through the last episode, I went through this after with Jack about, oh, I guess about seven years ago. I'd done six fourth steps. I was on my sixth fifth step, and he finally said, you're just wearing my ass out. <laughs> you know? <laughs> he said, did you ever think there might be a few more steps in this process? <laughs> no, the truth's right here. If I just inventory enough, I'll figure the son of a bitch out, right? You know? <laughs> Different plateaus of surrender. Comes real close on the heels of, uh, heels of the manageability of life. You know? I mean, I'm really hooked into this manageability of life. Twist it, turn it, twist it, turn it. You know? I used to hear the old timers say, so-and-so had a relapse. Well, had a relapse. Uh, he just didn't get a hold of the first step. And I'd say, that means that he just didn't know he was powerless over alcohol. As the years have unfolded, I know what it really means is they did not recognize the unmanageability of life. <coughs> They did not recognize the unmanageability of life. I will squeeze the by God results out of this thing if I have to kill every son of a bitch in this room. I'll get it. <laughs> you know? And it will go this way. That's the truth. That's what you got to do. If you want the truth, go that way, you know? But Burns, I don't sit there. I don't care. Go that way. If there's a balance in this program for me, the balance is between, and it has only come with time and with being down in the trenches to recognize the balance between the surrender to God's power and my responsibility. When do I turn it loose and when do I stay with it? When do I turn it loose? And there's no way intellectually I know how to tell you how to do that except to follow the principles, to follow the steps. And with enough time, that's what happened to me. I was able to have a better balance and it's still growing because I'm a baby in this thing. I'm 16 years and that may mean a lot to some of you. The rest of you know I'm still a baby and still growing on a daily basis. What I also got back from you as I surrendered to God's power was a screaming message was, okay, it's God's power. It's your responsibility. See, I lived eight and a half years in this program on a three and a third step program. The first three and a third of the twelfth step. Oh, I went out. I got more. And this wasn't notching my belt. My first sponsor told me, he said, if you want to stay sober, go help drunks. I would find drunks in places they hadn't even known they were getting ready to get drunk at first, you know. <laughs> and I'd drag them off to treatment. I'd bring them to meetings, and it kept me sober. I'm absolutely convinced this day it kept me sober because I was out there getting out of me working with those drunks. And some of those people after eight and a half years, where I, well, they were just happy as hell, and I was goofier than a snake. <laughs> I was goofier than a snake. Absolutely. And didn't understand what the goofiness was all about. And driven to my knees through a set of circumstances that had a bedrock of my self-centeredness, I was brought into the simplicity of this entire process, including all of it. I had the sponsor. I went to multiple meetings. And then I became a student of the big book. And then I did what the big book said. And then I took it into my heart. And it became a part of me. And then I had the entire program of trust God, clean house, and help others. <laughs> I tried to carry tons of things I didn't have. I didn't know that. This was not intentional. If you want, if my experience means anything, if you want to live with a three and a third step program, you can do it and stay sober on how happy you can be. But the last seven and a half years of my life have been with a full 12 step program and it's as different as daylight and dark. It's as different as daylight and dark. And that's my experience. If you want the, whole, I've talked to four people down here this time that have been sent to me by other people. 
And each one of those people, they say, I'm working the program. Why do I feel like shit? Why am I so miserable? Maybe I have a dual diagnosis. Maybe I should be on medicine. I don't know. As I said, well, tell me about your AA program. Well, I've got a sponsor. I go to meetings. When's the last time you read the big book? About a year ago. What are you doing with your spiritual preparation for today? What about the steps? Well, I got a sponsor and I go to meetings. I'm going to 75 meetings a week and I talk to my sponsor 23 hours a day. You know? I've watched people and I did it get impaled on the third step and page 449 in the big book. Get impaled on it. Use it as excuses. Walk away from the responsibility. And Clancy said, call and tell them you're going to be there. Call and tell them you're going to be on time. Just the deal of common decency and courtesy and following those principles to be able to be aware of that. Second thing I've found in my life that has not changed is that I'm powerless over alcohol. Alcohol whipped me. Alcohol whipped me. It whipped me. I'm so grateful. It whipped me. I started taking amphetamine in 1958, my freshman year in medical school. I took it till 1970. I did not drink. Drinking was not an issue. It was not a problem. Amphetamine at that point in time in my life did what I needed to do. I quit taking amphetamine in 1970. I didn't quit taking amphetamine because I was powerless over it. I quit taking amphetamine because you kept blowing smoke up my butt and causing me a lot of problems. <laughs> and I got tired of that. Now, it was not that obvious, but that's exactly what happened. I just quit taking amphetamine because I got tired of living with you reminding me of the consequences, like putting me in mental hospitals, you know, and taking away my medical license and doing all those things. But I wasn't powerless. Never even for a moment thought I was powerless. Then I started drinking. I drank eight years. And that December the 1st, 1977, I was powerless. I was completely and totally powerless. And uh, take care. Completely and totally powerless. Alcohol whipped me. It left me nothing. Completely devastated me. For people who say to me, and I'm in a meeting with them, they'll say, I'm not sure that I'm powerless over alcohol. I think to myself, oh God in heaven, what can I do to bring them to light? I know it will take what it will take. It may take a relapse. I hope it doesn't. It will take what it takes, and it took what it took for me. But I hope your journey doesn't have to be as devastating as mine was. I looked at, and, and I don't mean the journey of losing a practice or the journey of losing a car. I'm talking about the carnage of the people laying around me. I'm talking about my mama and my daddy. I'm talking about my marriage. I'm talking about my children. I'm talking about there were no survivors. I looked around and I don't know what it means to you, but the thing I finally couldn't live with anymore is I couldn't live with the absolute pain that I caused everybody I touched. I could wipe my ass out and walk off. They could carry me out in a pine box, but I couldn't live with what I was doing to everybody I touched. I couldn't live with it. It whipped me. It whipped me. Third thing is that it'll take a power greater than me to restore me to sanity. Now, I'm not talking about a power greater than me to restore me to sanity from the insanity of drinking, because, yeah, it took that. See, I drank and I was insane. It took a power greater than me to take away the obsession and the compulsion. But I need to leave a message with some people who may come into this program looking to get good. See, I came in this program looking to get good. And when I got good enough, I know this peculiar mental twist. What I was thinking was maybe I can drink a little bit of white wine. I didn't think that, but that's the peculiar mental twist. I got to tell you where alcohol is concerned we're playing two sandwiches short of a picnic. You ain't never going to be able to drink a little bit of white wine if you're an alcoholic of my type. See, but, but it took a power greater than me. So when I'm going to tell you what I encountered was the real problem, I'm not negating the real power of alcohol and the difference in this alcoholic. But I got to tell you, once I quit drinking, I was faced with the real problem, and the real problem was Burns Brady. The real problem was Burns Brady. And it took a power greater than me to restore me to sanity from the insanity, to restore me to sanity from the insanity of Burns Brady. You know? You ever had a day when you just had your belly full of yourself? You ever had one of those days? 
You just had your belly full of yourself. I was walking down the hall in my office about three years ago, and that was one of those days. I just had my belly full of myself. See, what had happened is my, my patient came in, my gal in the front office hadn't put her up on time. Uh, it took them about two hours to get her back there. Nurse didn't put her in the uh, examining room on time. Didn't take her blood pressure. Didn't take her. Didn't take her pulse. Didn't take her temperature. Didn't do all those things. So I walked in. This patient jumped on me and just cleaned my clock. I sat there and took it like the spiritual giant that I had become during these years. You see. <laughs> then I walked out and called both the girls back and did the only thing I could do under those conditions. I fired them. As they were walking down the hall, I thought, my God in heaven, how long have I got to deal with this insatiable ego? You know? Now, I'm not talking about the kind of ego that wants to go skydiving naked at the Super Bowl. No, that's not the kind of ego I'm talking about. And let me tell you, there's not one alcoholic in this room that wouldn't love to go skydiving naked at the Super Bowl. <laughs> you know? And those of us who are humble would wear a mask. <laughs> See? And, and see, and I know as a male that as we float down through there, we think, I bet they recognize me. <laughs> sure. That's just alcoholism. Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm talking about the kind of ego that says my way or the highway, right? This program's real simple. Not easy, but simple. Wilson described it. Simple, but not easy. It requires the destruction of self-centeredness. Marching orders in the tenth step. Each day we'll face self-centeredness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. What do we do? We could class God to remove it. We talk to somebody. We make our amends. We help somebody. You think this program's tough? Yes, yeah, it's tough. Is it simple? Damn right. And that's exactly it, the marching orders. I walked in, opened my office door, got on my knees, said, Dear God, please give me the power to do the right thing here. Picked up the phone, called my sponsor, talked to him about ten seconds. That's about the only time it took. Hung the phone up, called the gals back. They hadn't left yet. They know I'm coming back to get him. Hell, I fired him six months before. Here comes old Goofy. He'll call us back. <laughs> Called him in, set him down, talked about job descriptions, apologized for my attitude, and, uh, and, and we started off on a whole new deal, see? That night I went to my regular AA meeting or my, uh, my, my home group on Tuesday nights, a men's group. We walked in there and sat down and somebody said, anybody have a problem staying away from a drink? I said, anybody got a problem with her attitude? And I said, yeah, I'd like to talk about it. And I said, what's that? And I said, you know, today I just have about all this problem, with this ego that I can handle. I said, how long have I got to deal with this insatiable ego? This has been about three years ago. Everybody's quiet for a minute. Finally, one guy raised his hand that I, about my age, been in the program about three years in. He said, and I sponsored him partially for the first year. And he said, Burns, I don't know how long you got to deal with that insatiable ego, but you taught me you just got to deal with it for today. <laughs> You know, you raise them and they jump up and bite you right in the ass. What? Just like that. Isn't that the joy of AA? Those of us who try to be gurus, y'all just won't let us. We just bust our ass to be gurus and y'all make us stay in the circle. When we finish the prayer today, we will hold our hand and we'll be in a circle. And that's it. You know, today's guru in AA tomorrow may not be able to pick his nose out threatening his brain. That's just the way it is. You know? <laughs> What a magnificent fellowship and what a magnificent structure is that we help each other on a given basis and we stay in a circle. I grew up in a little town in western Kentucky named Mayfield. I grew up in a home where there was no alcohol and there were no drugs. My grandfather died drinking lye water in the Mayfield City Jail. My mother was molested physically, emotionally, and sexually in that home. And our home was dominated by alcohol and there was never a drop of it in the house. My mother was what is known today as a true adult child of an alcoholic. Now, I'm not going to get into controversy of whether they exist, but I'll take you to the chapter of the family after when it says if you're around us, get raised with us, or raised in a home with us, anything you want to say, you get neurotic. I just say you get goofy. You know, you get goofy. And Mama was one of the most loving, gentle people I've ever known. What a delightful little lady. Died in 1978, and I've missed her every day since then. God, Casey can tell you I think of my Mama every day. And these are not crocodile tears, folks. She's a neat lady, but she was goofy. <laughs> she was goofy and she was goofy from alcoholism because she never got a chance to deal with the rage and the shame and the guilt and all the stuff that went on in that kind of deal they had an interesting way of treating alcoholics in Mayfield at the time when my grandfather would get drunk they'd put him in jail when he got sober they'd take him out put him in shackles and put him in chain gang he'd sweep the Mayfield city streets and my mama used to walk at least once a month by her daddy in a chain gang sweeping the Mayfield city streets how do you think it made her feel how do you think it made her feel 
When I was in treatment in Atlanta, I was supposed to stay three months, and I left after two and a half months, and I knew it was time to go, and I checked it out with everybody. People in the treatment center didn't think it was time to go, but I knew it was time to go home. Fortunately, I had one counselor who believed that the issue wasn't, <clears throat> wasn't whether I went home or not, but the issue was whether or not I dealt with the whole package. <clears throat> As I got ready to leave, he said, Burns, I was in a, in, a, in a room with a bunch of guys in a circle, and he said, Burns, he said, uh, I don't think you ought to go home. I said, why? And he said, well, you haven't dealt with your anger. And I said, you kiss my ass. Of course I've dealt with my anger. <laughs> and he said, I said, oh me, oh me, I see what you mean. He said, come here, get in this circle. And I got out there and I sat opposite him. He was, he was sitting me, we were in folding chairs. And he said, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Answer them just as fast as you can. I said, okay. And the first question, he says, who do you hate most in your whole life? And I said, I hate my mother's guts. And for the next 30 seconds, which seemed like two weeks, a barrage of questions and answers, and I ended up on the ground with my arms around his calves, screaming how much I love my mother and how much I hated me. He picked me up and kissed me on the cheek, and I've never forgot. He said, now go home. You know what the problem is? AA can lead you to where you're going to go and where you'll have to go. He said, but let me ask you something. He said, tell me about your mother. And as I unfolded this story I just shared with you, he said, how do you think your mother felt? And for the first time in my life, there went a hole, the hole went through me and a pain went through me. And for the first time in my life with the relationship with that little lady, I realized her pain and my whole attitude went from mama give to me to mama, what can I do for you? If there's an attitude that changes in Alcoholics Anonymous for any drunk that gets happy, and certainly for this one, it's when the attitude changes from what can you do for me to what can I do for you? Started with my mama. I didn't know, I didn't know the rules yet, but I knew the feeling. That entire change. Mama's love in our home came out conditionally. If we were perfect, mama loved us. If we didn't, mama didn't talk to us. So I changed that real, I figured how to deal with that. I became perfect. Absolutely perfect. I was, I was perfect. I was Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. I mean, high school, college, perfect. Straight A's, everything. I would exact, I, you'd want to marry me, you'd want me to be your kid, you'd want anything. I was perfect. And I was really happy. Still had a funny feeling inside, but happy. I started medical school in 1958. Now I don't know about you, but there's always been a motor running in me. You got that motor, get to A, get to B, get to C, go to D, or you miss A, go back to C, what am I having A, but what am I going say? You watch Karen. Karen is a wonderful example of the motor, but everybody that's gotten up here, there's a motor. And I'm just like her. This woman and I have fallen in love, and she knows it's a wonderful relationship because I relate to that motor. Peggy, all of us, there's that motor. You see it? Boom, 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 just like that. A, B, C, D, go A. And Dean walked in. Dean walked in and said, there are 100 of you in this class. Only 75 of you will graduate. If there are 100 A's, the last 25 A's will flunk. Look at the guy next to you because he may not be here next year. I turned and looked at that sucker, and that sucker's looking right back at me. And I thought, holy <laughs> shit, it's me. I'm not going to make it. I couldn't study. I couldn't read. Big book calls it irritable, restless, and discontented. I couldn't study, couldn't read, couldn't sleep, couldn't do anything. After two weeks, I just packed up my bags and started home. A friend of mine walked up and gave me a little capsule and said, take this pill. Maybe it'll help you study. I took that amphetamine, and the motor stopped. Boom. Motor stopped. I found four things that will always stop my motor. Amphetamine, alcohol, sex, and Alcoholics Anonymous. All four of those will stop my motor just like that. AA works better than any of them. It just takes a little longer. And they haven't put me in jail one time for going to AA meetings. <laughs> and I got put in jail for all the others. I thought she really just wanted the $50 for a ride home, you know. <laughs> Didn't notice the hairy legs. <laughs> At that stage in my life, I might not have cared. Yeah. <laughs> get it where you can find it, you know. And sexuality does get to be an issue, and it can be resolved, and it doesn't matter which way the answer goes. It's just living at peace within the confines and structures of this program of Alcoholics Anonymous, including how we deal with sex. But in any event, AA works better than anything else. It just takes a little more time. Two weeks before graduation, everybody else in medical school took amphetamine, everybody else quit. I did not. Two weeks before graduation, I was kicked out of medical school. In an amphetamine rage, I beat up one of my medicine professors. They took me to the head of the department of psychiatry. He said, Burns, what's wrong with you? And I said, take too many drugs. And he said, do you believe that? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, we can help you. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, we're going to put you in intensive psychiatric therapy. He said, if you can figure out why you take that drug, you won't have to take anymore. 
That's called cognitive cause and effect thinking. What he said was you're going to think yourself into a way of acting. You're going to think yourself into a way of acting. Works on our daily lives every day. If you don't want to get, get run over by a bus, don't step out in front of it. If you, if you don't want to get bit by a wolf, don't sleep with one. You know, it's wonderful cause and effect thinking. Works in everything except the treatment of alcoholism. It just doesn't work. There are reasons why we know it doesn't work, but the fact is, statistically, in all probability, it will not work, and that's a fact. Psychiatric therapy helped me, and I'm not anti-psychiatry, neither is this program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Carl Young and Harry T. Bolt had a major impact on Alcoholics Anonymous. They had a great influence on Bill Wilson's thinking. I'm anti-ignorance, and the career that I changed was to teach doctors how to treat us. Because with my years of recovery and now the knowledge that I know it's to teach doctors how to treat us. It's to teach doctors how to treat us. It's also to carry the message to Alcoholics Anonymous is that there are a lot of people in our fellowship where I'm at home with you who are practicing medicine without a license. And both of those things are devastating. The doctors who don't know our disease and those of us who do not have the humility to recognize our limitations. So I'm anti-ignorance and I got involved in doing these things. I'm not anti-psychiatry. Psychiatry taught me how to identify feeling, y'all. And oh man, I knew more about feelings than you can shake a stick at. That didn't keep me sober, didn't keep me from taking dope, but it taught me a lot about feelings. Now, years later, I came to you people. You put it in a fourth step and took it through the rest of the steps and gave me a spiritual solution. And that's when I was able to quit taking dope and quit drinking <laughs> with a spiritual solution. But psychiatry did teach me how to identify a feeling and how to put a label on it. For a year and a half, I didn't take any amphetamine. Got ready to come back into medical school, and they said, how do you feel? And I said, I'm scared. And they said, why are you afraid? And I said, because they're going to watch me. He said, why are they going to watch you? And I said, because I beat one of them up. He said, is that a realistic feeling? Yes. Realistic thing for them to do. And I said, yes. I said, well, now you'll be okay. Going back into school, and you'll be fine. I walked in there, and I was just happy as a lark. And within 30 minutes, I strung out all amphetamine again and just sat and cried because I didn't know why. <laughs> I didn't have the spiritual solution. It just wasn't there. It just wasn't there. My classmates enabled me. I graduated in 1964. Between 1964 and 1967, I was in a mental hospital four times, strapped down, IV fluids, straight jackets, padded cells, the whole deal. Got out and went in the Army in 1967. Uh, almost got put in Leavenworth. Post commander came down and said, Burns, are you taking the amphetamine? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, if you don't quit taking the amphetamine, we'll put you in Leavenworth. So I quit. Once he explained it to me, I quit, you know. <laughs> but the deal was I could still quit. I still had that choice. I never stayed quit, but I could still quit. I might stay off six days, six weeks, six hours, six months, but I always went back and it always ate my lunch. Came home in 1969, had a gallbladder attack, which they attributed to the amphetamine. They took my gallbladder out. Two members of the board of Lassinger and the surgeon and one, my partner came down and sat beside my bed, held my hands, and we actually prayed. We actually prayed that that would be lifted for me. 1970 was my last amphetamine. Then I started drinking. The first four years was not alcoholically. I might get drunk. I might stay sober. As far as the drinking process was concerned, it wasn't alcoholic. It just wasn't an issue. I never thought about it. The next three years were alcoholic. Every single day, I, every single thought was about alcohol. I didn't get drunk that often. But every single thought and every single moment was preoccupied with drinking. When I would get my drink, how much I would drink, what I would do when I drank how I would go to football games and be able to stay through the whole game, how I could drink just what I wanted to and be able to get out of the parking lot. Every moment was obsessed with the quantity and the time. The last year my drinking was addictive. I drank a quart of whiskey a night. And I told myself I wasn't an alcoholic because I never drank in my office. And I could believe it. The delusion was complete. The pain wasn't yet over. My wife had left me. I forced her to kick me out of the house about 1970, I guess 75. I womanized and drove cars and did all kinds of neat things that I thought were neat for about a year. Uh, and uh, During that time, alcohol worked for me. I had a real problem with sexual dysfunction, and alcohol worked for me. I mean, it really did make me feel like a stud that I'd always been afraid that I couldn't be, and then it turned on me. And during that time, I womanized a lot. Uh, the guilt got deeper. Those were values that were real values that my mom and daddy taught me, and I stomped on them. Big time. Couldn't stand it, but continued to stomp on them. Bent them all, broke them all, lived outside the rules, and paid the price. But drank enough whiskey, I could put it off for another day. And I ran into Casey, who was one of God's greatest gifts to me, and knew I had a real, somebody I really wanted to be around, a real gift in my life. We moved in together and started, 
and uh, she continued to be a part of my life. Somewhere between Thanksgiving and December the 1st of 1977, Casey had gone to work, and I was sitting in our apartment in the Fontenay Apartments on Shelbyville Road, and I looked out, out the window. I tried to switch, to, because I knew I'd lose her. I tried scotch and water, and I drank a choice. I'd switch to martinis. I'd switch to beer. I had, one night, I drank 24 martinis and couldn't get drunk. The next morning, I drank a bottle of beer and couldn't walk for three days. You know, that, that's alcoholism. But I tried to switch my drinks, anything, but I couldn't. She'd gone to work, and I was sitting there looking at the sun coming up, and I said, I've got to quit drinking. I thought, you can't quit drinking. I said, well, I know what I'll do. I'll smoke dope. I thought, well, who are you bullshitting, you know? You took amphetamine for, for 12 years, nearly killed you. You drank for eight years, nearly killed you. For reasons you don't understand, none of this stuff works in your brain. I thought, well, then I'll just live out there in the world with nothing in me. I thought, you don't know how. You can't do it. I couldn't live with it. I couldn't live without it. I had reached the ultimate point that everybody reaches if they're going to make it in this program. Do I want to live or do I want to die? It may not be as stark as mine, but mine was, do you want to live or do you want to die? And I chose to die. I remember it as though it were yesterday. I just made the decision. I do not want to live this way. I don't know how to live this way, and I don't want to live because I can't quit drinking. Went in the, bed, in the bedroom, loaded my shotgun, put it in my mouth, absolutely at peace with dying. It was over. Terrified of living, didn't know how. People have asked me over the years why I didn't pull the trigger, and I'll tell you exactly why it took me 14 years to ever come to peace with why I didn't pull that trigger. It was the absence of dignity in that way of dying. The years in the Baptist church, the years with my mama, the years with my daddy, the values that I had learned, all of them golden. And I could not tolerate dying that way. If there's any one word synonymous with recovery for this drunk in Alcoholics Anonymous, and you've heard it referred to from this podium almost by every speaker, it's the return of dignity. For those people who never lost it, they don't know what we're talking about. For every one of us who lost it, and especially for those of us to whom it has come back, what a gift. What a gift. If you don't have it yet, stay with us. It will come. It will come. I crawled to the phone and called a good friend of mine who's a psychiatrist to ask him to help me. I went to his office. I sat in his office. He said, Burns, you got to go in the hospital. And I looked out at Our Lady of Peace, the hospital I'd been in those many times. I said, David, I don't want to go in that hospital. But I said the words that would begin my recovery. I said, I'll do anything you tell me to do. I became teachable. I quit negotiating. I quit trying to manipulate. I just became completely vulnerable, opened myself and surrendered. That magnificent step of surrender when I said, I'll do anything you tell me to do. He said, you don't have to go in that hospital. I don't know where you're going yet. It took him three days to figure out where to send me. He sent me to a psych hospital in New York. Because I sit there talking to David, and David said, Burns, what's wrong with you? I'd say, I'm depressed. He said, you think it's your drinking? I said, David, I'm depressed. He said, well, is it because you drink? He said, no. I said, no, David, you don't understand. I drink a quart of whiskey a night because I'm depressed. He said, no, you're depressed because you drink a quart of whiskey a day. <laughs> I said, David, God damn it, I nearly blew my brains out. I'm depressed. He couldn't jar it. Now, 100% of alcoholics coming into this program are depressed. <laughs> you know? What plants you say, that's just how it, but I do appreciate it because I hear you. I hear you. 100% of us are depressed. In three weeks, 75% of us will quit being depressed. And in two years, 98% of us will quit being depressed. You don't make a dual diagnosis in this program in less than two years short of a psychotic break. Okay? And, and, and the people who are clapping are the ones who have been abused. Now, let me tell you something. It's not the fact that Wilson said to us, if we go in and tell the doctors what's wrong with us, we'll get treated right. Well, that was a time when there weren't that many doctors treating alcoholism and there weren't that many alcoholics. And we can walk in and tell doctors today and about three quarters of the time, they don't know what the hell to do with us. And it's our job to teach them. I'm not putting them down. I'm one of them, and I love it. I wouldn't change my profession for the world. But my responsibility is to help them learn. And my responsibility to you is to say, hang ass on. Hang on. Hug that sponsor's neck and walk those steps as I did. And by God, it'll come up. But if you're like me, you'll live with it. Because I lived with it for a year, almost two years. 
And he said, he couldn't jerk me out of that thing. I'm depressed. You know, burns your drink. I know I'm drinking too much, but I'm depressed. So he sent me to a psych hospital in New York that made one flew over the cuckoo's nest look like a walk through Central Park. <laughs> and I was there for two weeks. My roommate hanged himself. I mean, tell you, it was, and I'm sitting there at the end of two weeks, and I'm on my knees, and I'm saying, God, I'm not auditing this course. I'm one of the patients. They ain't calling me doctor. <laughs> what in the hell is going on with this shit? You know, I mean, I am up to here. <laughs> and I mean, I sit there, I said, what is wrong with me? And all of a sudden, it dawned on me, I'm an alcoholic, and I thought, that's a good option right now. I mean, this is all right. <laughs> you know? Woo! Let, let the games begin, you know? <laughs> So I called him, and I said, David, I'm an alcoholic. He said, do you believe that? I said, yeah. And he said, well, I'm going to put you on a plane, fly you to Atlanta. And I went to Atlanta, went to an alcohol treatment center, stayed there for 28 days, stayed in a halfway house for a little over two months, and came home to you people in Alcoholics Anonymous. When I walked in, I said, what have I got to do to stay sober and be happy? And you said, you can do anything we tell you to do. You're going to act yourself into a way of thinking. You're going to act yourself into a way of thinking. Sawdust for brains. The, the, the absolute profundity of this program still just amazes me. I am so, I stay fascinated with this program. Used to be an old guy in Louisville named Charlie R. He died at 28 years of recovery. He always talked like he had a mouth full of uh, mush and a head full of valium. But this man had more spirituality than I ever knew. And he'd walk around to me every so often. He'd say, Barnes, are you fascinated with this program? <laughs> and I'd say, yeah, Charlie, I am. He said, that's good, because those people quit being fascinated. See him get drunk a lot. And he'd just turn around and walk off. <laughs> and I'd say, who was that masked man, you know? <laughs> But I mean, more and more, I stay fascinated with this program because you said you're going to act yourself into the way of thinking. I said, well, what do I have to do? You said, don't drink, go to meetings, read the big book. See, y'all thought I was going to tell you something really profound, didn't you? <laughs> Real said, don't drink, go to meetings, read the big book. And I thought, don't drink, don't drink. By God, they just beat that to death. Don't drink, don't drink. Talk it to them. My God, they just beat it to death. I wonder why they beat I know that's a fact. Why? And I put on a tape of Sandy Beaches, and you know, when we're ready, we'll hear. Put on a tape of Sandy Beaches. Every time he got drunk, it was a direct result of drinking. <laughs> I said, the man's a genius. He's figured the whole thing out. This is it. No, I thought it was being poor and having to caddy at the Mayfield Country Club. I thought it was that idiot first wife of mine. I thought it was the medical profession. He didn't understand my innate genius. Oh, no. Every time I got drunk, it was because I drank. I got that sucker wired right now. <laughs> Don't drink. Go to meetings. Okay, let me share with you 16 years of going to meetings. Let me take you back to that little home I was raised in. Junior year in high school, I come in after a football game. I'd had one bottle of beer and I normally didn't drink. Came in, sat down in the living room, threw up. Daddy came down, sat next to me. He said, Burns Mac, you've been drinking. I said, yes, sir. I had one beer. And we talked and he said, you're not drunk. And I said, no, sir, I don't drink. I just had a beer. He said, well, here, let me help you clean it up. Go on upstairs and we'll talk about it in the morning. To get upstairs, you walk from the living room up the stairs. Mom and Daddy's bedroom was right here. Now, remember this little lady who had been ravaged in that home. Her whole hope of getting above that without ever knowing it were her two boys. I was the doctor designate and my brother was the lawyer designate. I was the first son. I was the great hope. And here I was with the one thing that had destroyed her life, alcohol. And I had alcohol in my breath. And as I turned to walk up those stairs, Mama came roaring out of that bedroom and grabbed me by the hair of the head and went, What? 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 You little bastard, I'll never talk to you again. It took me eight years of psychiatric therapy and at least four or five fifth steps to ever be able to acknowledge what I felt. I wouldn't have said this in my home because I grew up in a home where you didn't say this. I'm grateful for that. But what I felt was, and you bitch, I'll never trust you again. And when I walked in this program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't trust a damn one of you people. Deacon in five churches, eight years of psychiatric therapy, and a hopeless drunk. But when I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't trust a one of you. And what I found out about this program of Alcoholics Anonymous is it's a perfect program composed of an awful lot of sick people in varying degrees of recovery. And some of us on a given day, by God, you can't trust. That's why we deal in principles over personalities. The personalities are fallible, the principles are not. There are people who wanted to borrow money and they did, didn't intend to pay it back and they didn't. My first fifth step should have been on the front page of the Courier Journal because I had a sponsor who believed the group should know what's gone on with you. You know? You look at the, you look in the chapter, you know, at, let me tell you, you know why I stayed sober? Because I wanted it with everything I wanted because many things that happened to me as a result of this fellowship and as a result of my sickness 
real confusing to me. You know, read the sixth chapter, the fifth step about confidentiality, which talks about basically trust. And I was real confused. I finally began to ask people who wanted to take me to meetings, why do you want to take me to meetings? And the winners say, because we want to stay sober and we want to help you stay sober. And I saw the ones that had the white hats on and the lights were in their eyes and I found the winners. And if you want to find a winner, stick with those of us who are winners. And we'll take you with us and we will teach you everything we've got. By teaching, I have learned more than I've ever, ever thought I could learn by teaching and by walking and by practicing. Find those winners. I've had people come to me and say, I'm never going to a meeting over there at a certain, certain place, so and so, and some bitch talk right around. I say, oh, come on, me. You probably didn't hear it right. Take him to the meeting. This guy would start talking. I think, that son of a bitch is weird. You know, he's really happy. <laughs> hey, this guy was, was, he heard the truth. So we go to another meeting. Find a winner. You'll find a meeting. Find a winner. You'll find the meetings. Next, next thing I found out about me, Zims that don't go to meetings don't hear what happens to them. Don't go to meetings. <laughs> Jim Williams says that when he came in the program, he'd hide from his sponsor, sponsor would come get him. He'd hide and his sponsor would come get him. He'd hide and his sponsor. He said, one night he hid so well he couldn't find me. He said, next day he called me and said, well, Jim, you didn't hear what you supposed to hear. And he said, what was I supposed to hear? He said, well, I don't know. I heard what I supposed to hear, but you'll never know what it was you supposed to hear. <laughs> I've never walked out of a meeting that I didn't hear something I was supposed to hear. Most of the time I walk out feeling great, and as I walk out of that meeting, I'm happy, joyous, and free, and I think, God, I felt the Spirit. There's some meetings I walk out of, and I think, God Almighty, what's the message from that meeting? That idiot pissed me off. I don't have a thing from that meeting. God, what's the message on this meeting? I feel this voice say, it's in chapter 5, the fourth step. Look at your resentment, sucker, because you're liable to get drunk over this thing. I heard what I was supposed to hear. It's not always happy, joyous, and brief. Sometimes it's trudging. But the message is always there, and there are always messengers. <laughs> When I was driven to my knees and, and came to know this program as I know it today, there's so much, there is so much in that book and it's so simply stated and it's absolutely so powerful. And in the chapter there is a solution and paraphrased, there will come a day when we'll be unable to bring into our conscious memory with sufficient force the humiliation of our last drink. We forget. We forget. Actually it says the humiliation of a week or a month ago. We forget. I've had people call this state conditioned learning. I've heard people call this a prolonged recovery syndrome. What I know is God loved me so much that he allowed me to forget that intense pain and that incredible shame. And yet he loved me so much more as he gave me a program where each time I walk into a meeting, I'm gently reminded of every day and every minute of it. Because if I don't remember it, I will drink again. I'm promised that. I don't know what that means intellectually or academically. I know what it means factually. I am Burns Brady. You taught me that. I'm an alcoholic. And if I forget that I'm an alcoholic, I will lose Burns Brady. I go to a lot of meetings because that's where my friends are. And finally, I go to a lot of meetings because I don't want to miss the miracle. I laid on the floor in Lafontaine Apartments. And I said, dear God, show me a burning bush. And in his magnificent wisdom and his unfailing love, he sent me to you. And I wish you could see what I see and what each of these speakers has seen. The burning bushes. The miracle of God's grace. And the joy and the glory of Alcoholics Anonymous. Don't drink, go to meetings, read the big book. I got down, I'd take that big book, I'd say, I'm going to read. I'd open it, I'd start reading, I'd think, that's wonderful. And I'd close it and couldn't remember it. I'd, open it, I'd start reading, I'd think, that's beautiful. And close it, couldn't remember it. I'd come to a meeting, I'd say, I can't remember anything. He'd say, hell, don't worry about it. None of us can. <laughs> I'd come back the next night and I'd say, I can't remember anything because I forgot what you told me the night before, you know. <laughs> I lost my car drinking for years. I lost my car sober for two years. <laughs> I'd drive my wife, I'd drive to work, park, practice medicine, get in the car, drive home, ride to work. Practice medicine, get in the car, drive home, drove Casey's car one day, parked that car, went in and practice medicine, came out and looked around. And I thought, oh, my God, somebody stole my car. <laughs> went and got my partner, and I said, Dave, come out here and help me. Somebody stole my car. I was crying. I cried a lot in that first two years of recovery. <laughs> got Dave. Dave said, you drove Casey's car. And I said, oh, that's right. I forgot. <laughs> so they assigned me a parking space. <laughs> And they said, when Burns leaves the office, he's going to that parking space. And if he get whatever's in it started, he's going to drive it home. <laughs> oh, hell yes. Hell yes. 
Well, well, if I can't remember anything, it ain't going to work for me. Dear God, how's it going to work? How's it work? And I remember thinking, we read how it works. That's, I bet that's it. So I said, getting better. So I got down, I looked there, and here it is. And how it works. And I started reading that sucker, and right there in that first paragraph, boom, boom, boom. Honesty, honesty, honesty. Three times, honesty, honesty, honesty. We can have grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of us do recover if we have the capacity to be honest. Those who don't make it are those who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. Honesty, honesty, honesty. My credo became don't drink, go to meetings, and don't tell lies. That was very important to me. Don't drink, go to meetings, and don't tell lies. When I went into treatment, quart of whiskey a night, you've heard it. Begged to go into treatment, walked in the front of the guy running the treatment center, sat down, looked at him, he said, Burns, how much do you drink? I said, I drink a six-pack of beer every night. <laughs> he said, you're lying. I said, I know what I do at all time. Why do I do that? <laughs> I used to play golf, and I'd hit my golf ball on the green. I'd go up there and put a dime in front of the ball, and I'd go back and put the ball in front of the dime. I'd just save myself a fourth of an inch on a 60-foot putt. Hated my guts, did it time after time after time. I got sober that first summer I came back. I couldn't walk, talk, and chew gum, but by God, I could spot my golf ball, right? I hit that ball on the green, go and put that dime in front of that ball, put that ball back down behind that dime, and I'd walk off that green feeling good about me. Couldn't find the cart, but I felt good about me. You know? <laughs> Somebody said, you ask Burns Brady anything, he'll tell you the truth. May not have, to do it, may not have anything to do with what you're talking about, but he'll tell you the truth, you know? <laughs> People said, to me, well, that sounds like cash restaurants. You bet your ass it's cash restaurants. Since it's important in my life today as it was the day I walked in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. I can tell you half the truth or half truth, and it eats my lunch. And I know when I'm doing that because it just eats at me. The fifth, sixth chapter, fifth step says we've got to be honest with somebody. I was taught in treatment we're only as sick as our secrets, and I can tell you for a fact that's true. We're only as sick as our secrets. And I can tell you half the truth or half truths, but I know it, and it guts me, and it guts me. And we get so sophisticated in wanting to be honest with ourselves, and I believe that. But let me tell you the hooker in being honest with myself. It's that peculiar mental twist that is defined in the ten steps as alcohol is subtle. We are not cured of our alcoholism. What we have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Alcohol is subtle. Cunning, baffling, powerful? That means all right to me. Subtle means everything. The peculiar mental twist. I can believe the lie on my journey to get a drink. Clancy says he's traveling 20,000 feet, 20 years sobriety, AA's blowing him. He said, God, how are they doing? God says, Clancy, they're doing good. Clancy says, how am I doing? He said, you're doing, too, you're doing fine too, Clancy. I bet you could have a light beer. <laughs> Had it come out in my life two years sober. Young lady came up to me and says, my birthday is next Tuesday. I want you to talk at my birthday. I said, where are you going to have it, Patty? She said, going to have it at St. Thomas. I said, that's my home group. That's a discussion meeting. We've never had a speaker there. My birthday, I can do anything I want, and I want you to be the speaker. Let me go home and pray about it, Patty. I get home, and I'm two years sober. I get on my knees, and I said, God, what do you think we ought to do next Tuesday at St. Thomas? It's Patty's birthday. Should we have a speaker meeting, and should I be the speaker? And I felt the voice say, yes, there should be a speaker meeting, and you should be the speaker. You know? <laughs> and so I go and I call the guru of the meeting. You know, every meeting has a guru. You know, they sit beside the door and they take everybody's inventory coming in. We have to rotate our gurus about a monthly basis because they burn out a lot. You know, they have this problem. <laughs> but I called the guru and I said, Jim, we're going to have a speaker meeting next Tuesday at St. Thomas and I'm going to be the speaker. And he said, how did you figure that out? I said, I prayed to God and God said it'd be okay because it's Patty's birthday. He said, I don't know. Let me get back to you. Let me get back to you. He was at the Token Club and he called me back in about 15 minutes. He said, strangest things happen, Burns. Don't understand it. He said, Fritz, and he named five people who are dear to me today as they were then. We ran like a bunch of little thieves. He said, Fritz and Jim and Jim and I have all sat down up here. And he said, I don't understand it, but I just got to tell you the way it's come out. And I said, what's that, Jim? He said, well, we prayed to God about whether that meeting should be a speaker meeting and you'd be the speaker. And he said, right now it looks like it's five to one, the God of our understanding over the God of your understanding. <laughs> I need every bit of that spiritual condition to help me deal with the delusion. Yeah, I want to be honest with me, and I bust my ass to be honest with me, but alcohol is subtle, and I need a sponsor. I need a home group. I need a close-knit support group. I need the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I need all 12 of the steps, and I need to end up being of maximum service to God and my fellow man to maintain a spiritual condition where the peculiar mental twist doesn't whip my ass on a daily basis and allow me to believe the lie that takes me right back to the day I take that drink because I say it's okay, I can have a light beer. And that's not because I'm a piece of shit, it's because I'm an alcoholic. And if you want to make it any more complicated than that, then you've got a lot more road to travel. You got a lot more road, and my prayer to you is, dear God, stop the journey. 
hold our necks and walk with us in the simplicity of the truth. After two years, the, 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 the cloud came up and I became little Mr. AA. You know, get up on time, eat your breakfast, do your meditation, say your prayers, get to the office, see your patients, get there on time, call your sponsor, call your wife, eat your lunch, call your sponsor, call your wife, get home in the evening, uh, eat your supper, get to the meeting 30 minutes early, greet the newcomer, set up the ashtray, set up the coffee, participate in the meeting, stay 30 minutes late, give the newcomer your number, get his number, get home in the evening, love your wife, say your prayers, call your sponsor go to sleep boom 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 little Mr. Perfect AA can any of y'all relate to that <laughs> as alcoholics we were undisciplined we allowed God to discipline us this way and it was rolling it was rolling it was rolling I used to talk to my sponsor in that first three years and I'd say Jim what do you think the psychological significance of my always being late in the morning <laughs> and he'd say why don't you get your ass up on time Burns <laughs> And I was being disciplined in this wonderful program of alcoholic economics. I mean, five years in this program, I am little Mr. Perfect AA. <laughs> and old timers would come up to me and say, how you doing, Burns? I'd say, I'm doing fine. This is a smile, you idiot. You know, just like that. <laughs> and they would just laugh and walk off. Five years in the program, I'm in South Georgia and Thomasville visiting an Episcopal priest who was my spiritual director. We don't talk about it much anymore, but when I came in, we did, and we had spiritual directors. And Jim had moved to South, uh, to South Georgia. Casey and I had gone down to see him and Pamela, and we came back to the motel room and I got on my knees and I said God take away the pain please take away the pain Casey put her hands on my shoulders and said call your sponsor my sponsor had a two step program that's not a, that's a report that's not a judgment he had a two step program number one and number twelve let me tell you what he said there are no coincidences in this program he was the messenger I called Jim and I said Jim I'm flying apart he said Burns he said you're the most compliant SOB I've ever known I said Jim will I get it and he said I don't know when you come home we'll talk about it I started to hang up and he said Burns let me ask you something. I said, what, Jim? He said, do you believe if you work these steps perfectly today, it'll make you good? I said, yeah. He said, you're wrong. He said, do you believe if you get drunk today, it'll make you bad? I said, yeah, I do. He said, you're wrong. I said, I don't understand, Jim. He said, Burns, you've been trying to buy something that isn't for sale. You can't earn it. It's yours. God loves you just the way you are. <coughs> You can't kick it away. He loves you drunk. He loves you sober. He loves you in the wrong bed. He loves you cheating. He loves you stealing. You'll feel better about yourself if you don't do those things. And there are 12 steps that will help you do it. But God loves you just the way you are. The parable of the prodigal son became a reality to me. Yes, it's the drunk who comes home. Yes, it's the brother who has the resentment. But it's really the story of the father who waits. Father who waits, and when I will take out my hands and take his hands in my hands, it's always there. It's always there. For the next three years, God was teaching me and getting me ready to love as unconditionally as he loves me. All my life, I've taken hostages. Every drunk takes hostages. And in and outside of recovery, we take hostages. My second biggest hostage was my sponsor. I picked a man who made all my decisions. I didn't make any decisions for eight years in this program. My sponsor told me exactly what to do, and I told my pigeons of what he told me to tell them what to do. And I mean, I lived in a perfect utopia. No responsibility. Just saving drunks. Dumber than a stump. Running around confused as hell. No responsibility. Finally, he got so goofy I had to leave. And I promise you, he, he did. I had to change all my meetings. I had to do it. I'd gotten a lot, of, a lot of prayer and a lot of support from other people, and I had to leave. Very, I was, just tore me apart. I love that man with all my heart and soul. He's still goofy, but he was God's messenger and gave me so much, there's no way that I can ever thank him enough except to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. My greatest, my greatest hostage was my wife. Casey and I had a perfect marriage. She did everything I told her to do. I put her right here on my hip and took her everywhere that I wanted to go. We went to meetings together. She was in al for five years, but I made sure she went to at least two meetings with me. I got her a telephone, put it in her car so that if she ever was in trouble, she could call for help. She averaged 11 phone calls a day, and 10 of them were from me. You know, 
I'm just seeing if you're okay. Where are you? I'd call her at 10 in the morning and say, I love you, Casey. And she'd say, I love you, too. I'd call her at 3 in the afternoon and say, I love you, Casey. And she'd say, I love you, too. I'd call her at 10 in the morning. She wouldn't be home. I'd call her at 3 and I'd say, Casey, I love you. Where in the hell were you this morning? <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we had sex when I wanted to. We prayed when I wanted to. She was right on my hip. Finally, she came into Alcoholics Anonymous, came to me and said, Burns, I've never loved you more, but I want to go to my own meetings. I want to go back to school. And I want to go into therapy. And I remember thinking, I remember saying, that's fine, sweetheart. What I felt was, and I'll not trust you, you bitch. I went to Jack, so I went to Jack and I said, Jack, I don't need this shit. I'll get me another woman. <laughs> he said, be fine. You can get another woman if you want to, but you'll run her off just like you're going to run this one off. And I just sat there and cried. I didn't know why. When the student is ready, the teacher will arrive. And a little pigeon of mine with seven months of sobriety walked up and gave me some tapes, eight tapes. As I looked at those tapes and listened to them, it was Joe and Charlie's big book, of the study of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I realized a program that I didn't have. I had 12 copies made, gave them to 11 of my friends, and we began a big book study. It's still in existence today. We've rotated some people in and out. One of the fellows who was one of the original members is going to die. First one we've lost. As I studied those tapes and we studied together and we prayed together, it became obvious to me what the deal was. I was here to be of maximum service to God and my fellow man. Translated in my marriage, I began to support Casey in her journey of her education. Instead of bitching because she wasn't doing it my way, I began to support her in her journey. She graduated two years ago, number one in her class. What she wanted for graduation was a little red truck. So we went and got a little red truck, and that license says, my truck. <laughs> I had ravaged that relationship so badly, we had to go into therapy, but we both took a whole different spiritual attitude. She's always had it. I didn't. But I took that whole spiritual attitude into establishing the communication and healing some of the wounds that my self-centeredness had caused. I made some incredibly bad decisions based on my self-centeredness and my hostage taken, and I damn near shot off my foot and her foot and the entire relationship. It was not easy to overcome. Only her great love for me and my great love for her and my absolute desire to figure out why I was here and the journey God took me on to be of maximum service did that marriage survive. I'm not saying all marriages will survive. I'm telling you about mine and the change in my attitude based on the information that I got from this program. I've carried that entire attitude over to my whole community. I'm an asset to my marriage. I'm an asset to my profession. I'm an asset to Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I came to believe what I've been taught, that my only purpose here is to fit myself, not to be of, but to fit myself to be of maximum service, to give away what I've got, not what I don't have. Somebody says, well, that sounds like codependency. No, I know codependency. Codependency looks like spirituality. There's a great difference. One has strings and one does not. And I live today with no strings on a daily basis as best I can and remain human. <coughs> well, what about accepting unacceptable behavior? A magnificent promise right before the promises. Read it. We never talk about it. If we're sensible, tactful, considerate, and humble... As God's people, we stand on our feet. We don't crawl before anybody. Not a statement of arrogance, a statement of complete surrender and humility. Today, if you are doing something that absolutely is destroying me, I can say to you, if I can be of help to you, Johnny, let me know. You can't be in my life, but I'll be of help to you. I used to say, as I left, that all alcoholics leave messages and you can kiss my ass. <laughs> you know? Does that sound familiar? We always leave messages. And I can walk away and say, if I can help you, let me know. No strings. I'll tell you two stories and I'm gone. I appreciate your tolerance. I appreciate your patience. That's the foundation of this whole deal. First has to do with my daughter. 17 years ago, my daughter said, straddling my chest. I was passed out on amphetamine. I was passed out on alcohol. She was strung out on amphetamine, Darvon, Valium, alcohol. She didn't shoot me because it's an automatic shotgun. She couldn't figure out how to load it. Twelve years ago, my daughter came in Alcoholics Anonymous. Five years ago, she got married, and guess who she has to give her away? Now, I'm not sure these things will happen in your life, but I promise you, you stick around AA, something will happen. 
and it will be good, <laughs> better than you could ever imagine. Two years ago, I came home from a conference on June the 22nd. I was 55 years old on that date, and it was Father's Day. As Casey and I drove up the driveway, there were balloons above the mailbox, balloons above the door, and balloons above uh, the garage, and I turned the balloon around and says, to the world's greatest dad on Father's Day, love, sissy. My son's 26. He came in AA nine years ago. He flunked out of high school his senior year because of alcohol. He lived with Casey and me from age 11 to age 15, 14. He left and went to his mother, and he's now told us because he was drinking, he knew daddy, and, 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 and Casey would find him out. So he went to his mother. His alcoholism really flourished with, with, with Sally. Um, he, he's allowed me to tell this story. He stole all of her jewelry piece by piece. She either didn't know it or ignored it. Stole all of her silverware piece by piece. She either ignored it or didn't, you know, didn't say anything. They stole her car. She just couldn't ignore it anymore, you know? <laughs> <laughs> she left him in jail. He came back for a year. Please listen to me here. For a year, Casey and I had been deep in spiritual preparation to do what was absolutely correct for that boy. For one year to be able to live with the consequences of doing what was correct. Burns came to me after he got out of jail, and he said, Daddy, I'd like to live with you in case. And I said, you can't live here unless you get treatment. He said, treatment for what? I said, treatment for your alcoholism. He said, I'm not an alcoholic. I said, if you want to live on the streets, that's your call. You want to live here, that's mine. He said, screw you. And turned around and walked out of the door, and I dropped on my knees, and I said, dear God, please give me direction with my sponsor and with my meeting, everything I needed to know what to do, what was right for that boy and to live with the consequences. Maybe he wouldn't make it. For four months he lived on the streets. I knew where that boy was every day, every minute, damn near it. And I said, God will tell me what to do. After four months he came and said, Daddy, please get me help. Sent him off treatment. He came back. Two years later he was in a meeting. A woman raised her hand and she said, my boy went off to camp with two boys. They caught them smoking dope. I know my boy's smoking dope. What can I do to help him? A couple of us talked. My son said, I don't know what you can do to help him, but said, uh, I don't know what turned my life around. He said, when I was out there on those streets, he said, I remember my sister, and I never quit loving her, but she became less than a lady, and said she came in day and became a lady. He said, but what turned my life around was my daddy. So my daddy would come home and beat up my mother. He'd come up with me and sissy. Then he left and he went into alcoholic. He left and still drinking. He'd call us and tell us he'd pick us up and he'd never show up. He said, and he got into alcoholics anonymous. He came back and told Mama he was sorry and I heard him. He gave Mama money that he owed her and I saw him. He didn't know I saw him. He said, then he'd call me and Sissy and tell us he's coming to pick us up and he would always be there. He said, when I was out on those streets, I wanted, knew I wanted to grow up to be just like my daddy. Two years ago, he started a little business, and we sat down and talked about how he started a new business, and I was sharing with him. Two men sat and sharing their experience. We got up, and I hugged him. I said, I love you, son. He said, I love you, Daddy. As I walked out across the street to get in the car, he said, hey, Dad. And I said, what? And he said, don't drink. Go to meetings. Read the big book. <laughs> Last story is my daddy. Mama died in 78, died of cancer. I got a year, about eight months to talk with her, and God, I loved her. Mama said, Burns, we never had any problems. I worried about you when you didn't write. I said, God, I love you. And I said, Mama, I love you. Appreciate you asking me to be here. But most of all, I thank you for delivering me the message that gave me my life. Godspeed. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.